It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tom Bridgeland from the University of Sheffield, who will speak on geometric structures and the spaces of quadratic differentials. Okay, hi everyone, thank you. Um, so uh, yes, so today I'm talking about uh, some, uh, some things which came out of a, a sort of a long running project um, involving DT invariants, um, but there's not really gonna be any DT invariants today. Um, it's um, more about some geometric structures involving moduli spaces of objects on Riemann surfaces. So, you know, Higgs bundles and flat connections and this sort of thing. And this is um, partly joint work with uh, Nikita Nikolaev, who's a postdoc here in, uh, in uh, Sheffield, and Menelaus Sikidis, who's a PhD student here. Okay, so um, let's see, can I move on a slide? Yeah, okay, that's not the way I would choose to. Huh. Why is that happening? Anyway, I can do it. Um, so this first slide is some motivation. Um, nothing here is really necessary for the, um, for the rest of the talk. Um, so the idea, which is a pretty old one by now, is that um, just as, um, well, there's a classical story of mirror symmetry, which uses genus zero gromov witten invariants to define a geometric structure, um, namely a Frobenius structure. So this is, um, you know, this is a important part of classical mirror symmetry. Um, and more or less by analogy with that, um, it was, I mean, a few of us were thinking that maybe you can use um, that DT invariants um, similarly encode geometric structures. Now, um, that's a pretty uh, weak analogy. There's no real reason why the first line would imply the second line at all. But anyway, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say this because it's uh, true. Um, uh, and the first person who really worked on this or wrote a paper about this was uh, Dominic Joyce um, back in, I looked it up actually. So it's back in 2006, he wrote a paper, paper about holomorphic generating functions of DT invariants, um, which is a pretty remarkable paper. Um, so DT invariants, the most natural context for defining those things is something called the space of stability conditions. So you, you start with some three-dimensional calabi yau triangulated category. And if you choose a stability condition on that thing, then hopefully um, you can define um, DT invariants. And then there's a whole story about what happens as you vary the stability condition and these DT invariants change. Um, so anyway, the this is all highly conjectural for now, but we at least understand what structure you're looking for, um, at least if everything goes your way. Um, and I've started calling this a Joyce structure because really the basic ingredients appear in this paper of Dominic's. Um, so I'm certainly going to explain what this Joyce structure is in the next few slides. Um, so I should say that um, this needs for this to work. Um, you, at the very least, you need some strong finiteness conditions on the DT invariants. So don't worry if this is all gobbledygook to you at the minute. I mean, this is all going to get forgotten very soon. But uh, for the experts in the field, I feel I should be honest and say this. Um, you know, to even get started, um, you know, the procedure from going from DT invariants to this conjectural joy structure, um, for that to be... You know, it's a conjectural procedure, but even to get started, you need some um, uh, growth conditions on the DT invariants. So, I mean, these things are typically indexed by a lattice. You could think of this as maybe the churn characters um, are living in some lattice. And then you should take a sum like this, and for R large enough, you would like this to be finite. And if you take this thing to be the derived category of a compact Calabi R threefold, Physicists tell us that this is not going to be true. Okay, so, you know, this is kind of a, a complete disclosure thing. I mean, we're really making an initial stab at this problem. And, you know, there are lots of things that we don't understand yet. However, there are plenty of interesting examples where we can make good computations. And I'm going to talk about some of those today. So in particular, there is some class of examples for which this space of stability can be, so a class of examples of these triangulated categories um, for which this space of stability conditions has been understood. And 
it has a very concrete description as a moduli space of Riemann, Riemann surfaces equipped with quadratic differentials. Okay, so these are the examples we're going to focus on today. And at this point, we can just kind of forget about BT theory and talk about what this joy structure should be living on this space of quadratic differentials. Okay, so I want to kind of um, claim that this is an interesting geometric structure that uh, is worth considering quite apart from its link with DT theory. Um, and so that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. And maybe at the end, I'll get time to say a little bit about how it fits into this more general picture I'm talking about, I, I'm, I'm describing here. Okay, so just to give something about the flavor of what this is, in some ways it, it resembles a, a kind of complexified Hitchin system. So, you know, the Hitchin system, you know, in one complex structure, this is the moduli space of Higgs bundles on a Riemann surface um, for some group, and the group here is always going to be PGL2C. Um, and the space we're going to end up constructing has twice the dimension of the Hitchin space. And the most famous thing about the Hitchin space is that it's a hyperkähler manifold. And we're also going to have a hyperkähler manifold, but it's a, a complex or a holomorphic hyperkähler manifold. So we'll, we'll explain what that means in a minute. But yeah, so in, in some ways it resembles a kind of complexified version of the Hitchin system. Um, I don't for the you know I don't for a minute want to pretend that it's as interesting as the Hitchin system, which is certainly one of the most interesting objects in maths. Um, but uh, anyway, that's just to give you some idea in your head about what it might be. Okay, so I'm gonna um, carry on now and um, first define what one of these joy structures is, and then we'll go on to discuss the particular example relating to quadratic differentials. Um, before I do that, does anyone want to ask any questions about this motivation? Good. Um, right. Okay, so yeah, so this is roughly the plan of the talk. There's going to be the definition of one of these joy structures. Um, then the meat of the talk is um, explaining this example, or this class of examples. And then at the end, uh, I'll talk about the twister space and some other topics associated with that. Okay, so we're going straight into basically the definition here, so you have to uh, pay attention, I'm afraid. Um, so we're going to start um, with a complex manifold, or I mean, it could be a, a variety if you prefer, but anyway, a complex manifold. Um, and we're going to let X be the total space of its tangent bundle. Okay, so we're going to want to think about the tangent bundle of X as well, so it's important that we we give this some notation okay so x is always going to be this is global notation x is always going to be the tangent bundle to m and then we're going to contemplate the following diagram so most of this doesn't quite make sense yet uh, I, I didn't work out how to overlay symbols um, but the, this short exact sequence here is something very basic this is just push forward on tangent vectors right so we have a map from x to m we can push forward from the tangent space to tangent bundle of x to the tangent bundle of M. But because we want everything to be living on the same space, we need to pull this thing back. Okay, but this is just the derivative of pi. Okay, and the kernel here is the vertical tangent directions. Okay, so we think of this thing as a bundle, and this thing is the bundle of yeah, vertical tangent vectors. Okay, um, so the first thing to note is this map new. Um, there is this canonical isomorphism here, which is just saying that the, the tangent vectors to the fiber, the fibers of this bundle, are themselves tangent vectors to M. Okay, so this is a slightly confusing point. It's because this really is the, you know, we're taking the total space of the tangent bundle. So the fiber directions are canonically identified with the tangent bundle of M. Okay. So I know I'm sort of laboring something completely obvious here, but uh, this is the geometry that's going to be around for the rest of the talk, so it's, uh, it's worth understanding. Okay, so these two bundles on X are canonically isomorphic. And then we're also going to think about a splitting of this bundle map here. And what that is, is precisely 
what's called an Erisman connection or nonlinear connection on this bundle pi. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture, and the next slide has a picture on, so that might be helpful. Okay, but in fact, let's just let's just go to this picture. Okay, so here's here's x, the tangent bundle to m, the total space of the tangent bundle to m. Here's m down here, and here's the projection. So this is just a picture of the tangent bundle. And the fibers, therefore, are the tangent spaces. And if I have, so what this connection is doing for me is that if I have a tangent vector downstairs, I can lift it upstairs to, to something which projects back down to here. That's why this map was a splitting. So by h of y, I mean this connection applied to the tangent vector y. It gives me a tangent vector to x, which pushes back down to that. And because this is an, you see, if this was a linear connection, it would be kind of invariant under translations in this vector space. And so the kind of vector you got here would be the same as the vector you got here. But this is a nonlinear guy, so there's no relation between this lift at this point or this lift at this point. Okay, so these are just different um, lifts. There's no relation between these two things. However, the other map we considered was this vertical map, which um, just considers y as a vertical tangent vector. So that's the other thing we can do. We can lift it vertically. Okay. And this thing really is translation in there. Okay. So it's, it's kind of trivial, but also confusing, I think. But this is basically what a joist structure is going to be. Um, so there's just a couple more conditions. So um, once we have this once we have one of these um, nonlinear connections, we can just add a constant times the vertical one, and that will give me another splitting of this map. Since you know, if I take a vertical guy and hit it with pi lower star, this just goes away. And for convenience, I mean it's a bit silly, but for convenience, it's good to denote this parameter by epsilon inverse. Um, okay, so this is what we're going to call a pencil of nonlinear connections on the tangent bundle. It's determined by a single connection because you just add these, um, these vertical ones. Uh, okay. And now there's a couple of conditions on these connections, namely that they should be flat and they should be symplectic. So let me just uh, say that. So um, I'm going to take uh, a holomorphic symplectic form on M. That's always going to be there. From the start. Um, and, and now I just want to assume that all these connections are flat and symplectic. So in fact, in fact, this, yeah, okay, so what so what does this mean even? Um, I mean the way I think of flatness is that locally x becomes a product of the base with a fiber, and the connection is, you know, so locally it's the same as a product, and the connection is just the trivial connection on that product. So, you know, by a diffeomorphism, you can relate X to a product. Okay, that's really what flatness means. Um, and symplectic means that you have these kind of, you can parallel transport. Um, by parallel transport, you get local diffeomorphisms of this fiber with another fiber next door. Um, and these fibers are symplectic vector spaces and you want that map to be symplectic. You don't want it to be linear. That would be like a linear connection. So you have sort of, yeah, you have parallel transport maps which map you from one fiber to other fibers, um, at least locally. You don't want to ask that those maps are linear, but you do ask that they preserve the symplectic forms. Okay. Um, right, so that's pretty much it. Um, so what I should say is that um, the condition that these guys are symplectic, it's enough to check it for just the original H, because adding V won't check that, change that, because V is a kind of, you know, if you integrate V, you're just getting translations of this fiber, and those certainly preserve the symplectic form. But asking that H epsilon are flat for all epsilon is, is non-trivial. You need to check that for all of them separately. Um, and this is where you see that this is actually quite similar to a Frobenius structure, if you know about Frobenius structures. So the basic content of a Frobenius structure is a pencil of flat connections on the tangent bundle. 
But of course, those are linear connections, right? So that's, um, you know, that's basically what a Frobenius structure is. It's a pencil of flat torsion-free connections on the tangent level. There are some extra whistles and bells. You know, you have an Euler vector field and an identity vector field and so on, but that's the, the basic content. And here we're getting something very similar, but um, instead of linear vector fields, uh, so instead of linear connections, we're getting these nonlinear but symplectic ones. And one way of saying all that is that you've sort of replaced the structure group GL of, of this vector space with the group of symplectic automorphisms of this vector space. So this is an infinite dimensional group um, instead of this finite dimensional group here. Okay. But it is, in, in formally, it's quite similar. Okay, and the structure I've just given you, it turns out um, it gives rise to a complex hypercalar structure on X. So the reason for this is just that you now have a splitting of the tangent bundle to X, namely it's the vertical directions and the horizontal directions, right? You've, uh, you can write this as a direct sum. And each of these is identified with the tangent bundle downstairs by these maps V and H. Okay, so basically you have, I mean, probably this should be pi upper star. You have two copies of the tangent bundle downstairs. Um, Tx splits as a direct sum. And so then you can just write down some basic objects here. So, um, so to make a hypercalar structure on X, I want to write down I, J, and K, some, some you know, quaternion operators on, on this tangent bundle. And in this basis, I just do it like this by these block diagonal things. And this metric uses the symplectic form to pair these two things. Um, so if you do this, um, it sort of, it follows from the fact that your connections are symplectic and flat, that these operators then preserve the metric G and are parallel for the associated Levitivity connection on the, on the tangent bundle of X. So it's, an, it's basically another way of saying the same conditions we had before. So I should emphasize that, you know, this is not the usual notion of a hypercalar structure, which is really a notion in real, you know, in you would be thinking about a real smooth manifold. Here we've got a complex manifold and we've got operators on the holomorphic tangent bundle. And the metric G is a holomorphic metric, you know, taking values in the complex numbers, but it still has a, a notion of a levi jupiter connection and we can, uh, you know, we can imitate the usual definition. This will induce a, a hypercalar metric on the underlying real manifold, um, except that it won't be positive definite metric. It will be a you know, signature NN type thing. Okay, but it's, it's much stronger because these things are varying holomorphic. Okay. And then, right, so this is the, this is the last part of the, um, the kind of abstract definitions, and then we'll get on to studying some geometry, some examples. Um, so just as with the Frobenius structure, there was some kind of basic idea and then some extra stuff. Um, and here we also have some extra stuff. For the full joy structure, we should expose some, should impose some extra symmetries, which are, um, well, as, I'll just put them all up, as follows. Um, there should be a C star action downstairs, um, which you can lift up to X and then everything should be appropriately invariant. I mean, I'm sort of skipping through this because it's not going to be important in the talk. Maybe we'll just mention how it works in the example at the end. Um, there's an involution minus one, which just, you know, I mean, the tangent bundle is a vector bundle. You can act by minus one and things should be invariant under that. And finally, um, uh, this, this will come up. So um, you expect, you ask that there is some integral bundle inside the tangent bundle. So, you know, the fibers of TM are C to the N, and you ask for a Z to the N sitting inside those. Um, a bundle of these lattices. That's called an integral affine structure. And then you ask that everything is invariant under translations by this. Or in other words, that this structure descends to the quotient of this by this. So instead of a kind of C to the N bundle, you're taking a C star to the N bundle 
Um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe see that in an example. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the end of the abstract definition. Um, any questions? Oh, great. Okay, so um, let me give an example. So the, the basic example we're going to be studying here is the, um, the space of quadratic differentials. So this is, um, I'm going to fix a genus G, and then I'm going to look at the space of pairs where C is some, you know, compact, complex Riemann, uh, yeah, compact, complex Riemann surface of genus G, and Q is some um, quadratic differential, so section of this line bundle, but I ask that it's got simple zeros. Um, and the aim somehow is to construct a joy structure on this space R. I didn't write M is equal to this. And one comment here is that this structure is going to end up having some poles. Um, so, so strictly speaking, this is a meromorphic version of what we had before. So, um, yeah, I mean, along some locus in the space X, the you know, the, if you like, if you think about it in terms of this hypercalar structure, the formulas for I, J, K, and the metric may develop some poles. Um, and we'll see why in a, in a minute. And the first thing to note here is that, um, well, that basically, um, well, let's just go from here. So if I think about the moduli space of Riemann surfaces, that's mg, the cotangent bundle to that, well, the tangent bundle would be h1 of the tangent bundle to the curve. So the cotangent bundle is this. And by Serre duality, this is the same as sections of omega squared, okay? So a quadratic differential on a curve, you know, um, can, be viewed, can be viewed as a, a cotangent vector to mg. Um, so this space, we've imposed this condition on simple zero, so we're not getting the whole bundle, but we're getting some open subset of the tangent bundle, of the cotangent bundle. And so in particular, that you've got some kind of symplectic form Okay, and that's the one that's going to come up in our in our definition. Um, and let me just briefly mention what this uh, what this link to stability conditions is. Um, yeah. Okay. So so first, I should say that um, although I'm just going to consider this case here in this talk, you might want to generalize to allow um, spaces of quadratic differentials. Um, where you allow the differential to have some poles of some fixed orders. Okay, so I, I, I use this notation. M here is a multi-index. It's, it's a collection of, order, of poles of some orders. And then there's a, a theorem, an old theorem of mine and Ivan Smith, um, where we assumed that uh, there was at least one pole, and it's recently been generalized by um, Fabian Haydn to the case relevant for this talk where um, the differentials are holomorphic. Um, and in both cases, you can cook up some CY3 triangulated category, such that if you take the space of stability conditions and mod out by autoequivalences, so the natural symmetries of the category, then you get this space. Okay. Um, so I'm probably telling some very small lies here. Um, strictly speaking, I should fix a connected component. I'm only getting one you know, in, in theory, there could be other connected components. And probably if one of the, these pole orders should all be greater than two for this to be strictly true, some strange things can happen. Well, there's a slight extra story if one of the pole orders is two or less. Um, but the thing also I want to emphasize is that Fabian Haydn's result is somehow, <laughs> it might look like it's easier, but absolutely not. This is the much more difficult case than the one we treated. Um, because somehow you get involved with studying the um, trajectory structures of these quadratic differentials when trying to prove this theorem. And uh, the, the trajectory structures of holomorphic differentials are actually much more complicated because when there are poles, the trajectories tend to just fall down those poles, which somehow makes it simpler. Um, anyway, so there are these results. Uh, and uh, in, in the case where there really are poles, this case that me and Ivan treated, 
Um, you can define this category in a couple of ways. So um, one way is via the Fokaya category of some non-compact Calabian threefold of this form. So it's kind of a, a quadratic bundle over your curve C, um, exactly given by this quadratic differential. The point somehow being that as a symplectic manifold, this is independent of which Q and C you take here. Um, or there's a more algebraic way of defining these things where you have, where you associate to the curve some, um, you actually take some blow ups at the poles. So you end up with some curve, uh, some surface, topological surface with boundary circles and marked points on them. And then you triangulate that surface and that gives you a, you know, there's a kind of combinatorial trick that gives you a quiver with potential. And then you prove that if you change the triangulation, the, um, the derived category or the Ginsberg algebra of this quiver with potential doesn't change. So that's how you define this, uh, this category. And that's uh, particularly work of Labadini Fragoso, for example, proved that uh, this is independent of the triangulation. Okay, so that's just to say that this kind of space fits into some story involving stability. Okay, so um, let's go back to this. So, um, so M is this space of quadratic differentials, so well, pairs consisting of a Riemann surface and quadratic differential, and we want to construct a joy structure on M because that will give us an example of this um, general theory. So. Um, I'm going to do this in several stages. So there are some basic uh, things we have to introduce first, I suppose. So um, the first basic thing that you do is that for each point here, you can define some um, other Riemann surface, which is the double cover of C branched along the zeros of your quadratic differential. So locally, it's given by this equation. Well, actually, globally, it's given by this equation inside the total space of the canonical bubble. So here's an artist's impression of this double cover. Here are the zeros of your quadratic differential, and it's branched at those points, basically. And you have a covering involution, swapping the two sheets. And um, this thing is smooth because we assumed that Q had simple zeros. Okay. Oh yeah, and then the, the, the sort of more or less by design, this thing is the place where the um, quadratic differential has a square root. So if you pull up this quadratic differential up to here, you can take its square root because that's really just y dx. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So yeah. So we'll denote this thing by phi. It's a canonical one form on sigma, which is anti-invariant for the invalid covering involution. Okay, so I'm moving towards defining this joy structure. The first step is something, um, knowing something about the period map for quadratic differentials. So I'm gonna introduce um, a vector bundle over M. So remember M is our space of quadratic differentials with the fibers being the anti-invariant part of the cohomology of this double cover. Okay. Um, and the thing is that this, one form, this canonical one form that I just discussed, um, that will, you know, its, it's cohomology class defines an element of this H1. So that defines me a section of this bundle. And then the theorem, I'm not sure who to attribute this to, um, maybe Hubbard or Mesa. Um, and I'll it, it, it's the following thing. So this bundle has an obvious Gauss-Mannin connection on it because, you know, as you vary the curve and the quadratic differential, these sigmas form a nice smooth family. So you, their cohomology um, has a Gauss-Mannin connection on it. And so you can differentiate this section with respect to that connection. That will give you a map from the tangent bundle to the bundle. And the claim is that this is an isomorphism. Um, a more um, down to earth way of saying this is that if I take a basis for my, for this homology of this curve, um, 
then of course we can transfer that, we can transport that to nearby curves. You know, I'm thinking of that about this family of spectral curves as the as the quadratic differential varies, I can just transport this basis locally. And then I can integrate the one form against these cycles, and that will give me functions on the base on, on M. And this claim is that these are local coordinates. Okay. So they, that's you know, that's kind of um, fairly easy to see why these two things are equivalent. I mean, if we want to know why these are, whether these are coordinates, we have to form the, um, <clears throat> the matrix of derivatives of these things. And yeah, the gaussman in connection gets involved. And, you know, when I differentiate this thing, yeah, well, I'll let you work it out, but it's, um, yeah, it's the same, <clears throat> it's the same statement. Okay, is everyone fine with that? So this is a this is a non-trivial fact about these moduli spaces of quadratic differentials. Um, they have canonical, more or less canonical, local coordinates. Uh, in particular, yeah, okay. we'll come on to that. In a minute. So, um, so my next mission is to explain this diagram. Okay, so it's not as bad as it looks. So, um, remember H was this bundle over M, which was just the cohomology of the spectral color as it varies um, with coefficients in C. But of course we could look at Z coefficients inside and that will define me some lattice. So the, the, um, the fibers here are the integral cohomology of the spectral curve. And via this identification, which we just had, we, we described this isomorphism between these two things we can take the image of this, and this will define me some integral lattice inside T of M. So this is exactly one of these integral affine structures that we mentioned before. So that's really one of the special things about these modular spaces of um, quadratic differentials. They have an integral affine structure given by this construction. In other words, what we're saying is that those period coordinates we just considered are kind of canonical up to integral combinations. And so this quotient, we can form this quotient, and it has fibers like this because we've quotiented the uh, complex cohomology by the integral cohomology. Okay, and so this identification we had before, more or less by definition, gives us this thing. And the fibers here are H, H1 sigma C star. Okay, but now by, um, you know, we can also think of that as maps from pi one into C star. Um, so by the abelian riemann hilbert correspondence, we can represent those things as the monodromy of line bundles with connection. Um, since <coughs> the cohomology classes are anti-invariant, these things should also be anti-invariant with respect to this covering condition. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to start doing this slightly strange notation for moduli spaces where I just put in brackets the things that are being parameterized. Okay, so um, the space M that we keep talking about is really parameterizing the curve with the quadratic differential. And now I want to think about that curve and the quadratic differential, but also a line bundle with this connection um, on the spectral curve. Okay, and this is the abelian riemann hilbert correspondence. It basically sends this pair to its monodromy um, which is an element of this cohomology group. Okay. And I'm telling a tiny, I mean, I haven't actually told any lies yet, but um, there is a slight subtlety which I'm going to try and sweep under the carpet, which is there are actually kind of two um, integral lattices in here, basically because H lower one and H upper one are not dual when you take anti-invariant. So H1 minus and H upper one minus are not quite dual. So there are actually two lattices here. Um, and the difference between them is like a copy of Z mod two to the two G. And there are little, so that has to do with spin structures on C. Um, so there is a tiny little bit of confusion here, um, which I'm gonna try to ignore as much as possible. But basically you should also, we really want to quotient out by the bigger lattice, and then this is not quite an isomorphism, it's um, a cover. 
but uh, let's not worry about that for now unless anyone asks any difficult questions. Okay. So there's only four steps in this construction. We're two, two of the way through. So, so what have we done? We, we've taken this space of quadratic differentials. We were supposed to be constructing some um, connections, some pencil of connections on the tangent level, nonlinear connections. Okay, well, we sort of said that we wanted these things to be invariant under some lattice. So instead of constructing them on the tangent bundle, we're going to construct them on this thing, which is the, you know, a quotient of this thing by, the, by this integral lattice. So instead of having fibers C to the N, it's got fibers C star to the N. Okay, so we wanted to try and construct a pencil of connections on here. Um, so equivalently, we can connect, construct a pencil of connections on here. And that's what we're going to do. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to turn this data on the spectral curve into data on C and then use isomonodromy connections. That's basically what we're going to do. Okay, so that involves the spectral correspondence, which relates data on sigma to data on C. Um, and the most um, classical thing, you know, incarnation of this is that given a line bundle on the spectral curve, you get a Higgs bundle on the curve downstairs on C. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically doing SL2 Higgs bundles here. So there are some extra conditions on determinants and so on. But the basic point is that you should take some anti-invariant line bundle upstairs and you should push it forward. Um, well, hmm, that's not quite true. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll give you the formula in a minute. But yeah, so you, you, upstairs you consider anti-invariant line bundles, and downstairs you consider um, a rank two bundle with trivial determinant and a Higgs field. And this Higgs field should have trace zero and determinant equal to um, minus, the, so minus the quadratic differential. And the way you get this is um, you, you take your line bundle L and you tensor it with the pullback of a spin structure from downstairs. You see, the problem is that, uh, I mean, ideally you would want both L and E to have degree zero because those are the nicest kinds of bundles, but you can't do that. So, um, well, basically, you know, you take your degree zero line bundle, you have to tensor it with something from downstairs and then you push it forward. And then that gives you a degree zero line bundle downstairs. And the Higgs field you get as follows. Um, remember this phi, this canonical one form on the spectral curve. Uh, slightly naughtily, I'm also going to consider it as a section of the pullback of omega c. You can do that. Um, and so this gives you a map from m to m tensor so this. And if you push this forward, by the um, projection formula, you get a map from E to E tensor omega C, and that's the Higgs field. Okay, so this is a very classical construction. Um, well, it goes back to Hitchin's original paper. What's not so well known is that you can enrich this construction by including a connection on the line bundle L and a connection on the vector bundle E. Okay, and obviously this is going to be good for us because. If we remember, we, up here we have the data of this line bundle. This will now give us a Higgs bundle on the curve downstairs. But we, but we also have this connection. What are we going to do with that? And the claim is that that also induces a connection downstairs. Okay, so that's what I have to explain now. And this is, well, I'm not going to explain, I mean, you know, this is probably the, the trickiest bit, or, you know, some would say the only interesting bit. Um, and this, I mean, this, you can find this in a paper of uh, Donaghy and Kantev um, from a long time ago. And it was also used by Dima Arinkin, but it doesn't seem to be that well known. So, um, yeah, you can include the data of this anti invariant polymorphic connection on L and a connection on E, um, which induces the trivial connection on the determinant. Um, so how does this go? You can, um, if you remember, so E is the push forward of M. 
this line bundle M on the spectral curve. So if you pull it back up again, we get some shorter exact sequence on the spectral curve that looks like this. So away from the branch points, pulling up E just gives you M plus the, um, you know, the pullback via the covering evolution. But, you know, stuff goes wrong along the branch point. So R is the branch divisor of this double cover. And you get a short exact sequence like this. So if you have a connection on E, so the correspondence actually goes in the other direction. This is somehow important. And it's not, um, it's not going to be completely everywhere defined. Well, it is going to be everywhere defined, but not everywhere invertible. So it's going to be, give me a birational map. Um, and the way this thing goes is that starting with a connection on E, you can pull back that connection to get a connection here. And then you can extend it here at the expense of possibly introducing poles along the branch points. Um, you know, you basically just use this as a gauge transformation. I mean, it's not quite invertible, but it's invertible if you <laughs> allow yourself coefficients with poles along the divisor. So you get a meromorphic connection on this bundle, and then you just take the, um, you know, the component along M, and that gives you a meromorphic connection on the line bundle M with poles of a particular kind along the branch divisor. But then when you do this tensor product, so you've got a connection on M, but that, I mean, there is a, uh, there is a canonical connection on this line bundle, can canonical meromorphic connection on this line bundle, coming from phi viewed as a um, gauge transformation from the trivial connection to this bundle, right? So phi gives me a map from O to this bundle, this line bundle. Um, and so I can take the trivial connection and use it to induce a connection on this bundle. And then I can take its square root, which will give me a connection on this bundle. So now I can, I, I tensor across, I get a, a connection on L and it turns out that this thing will be holomorphic. Okay, so that's how I get my holomorphic connection on L. So obviously there's a lot, you know, things need to be checked here and I'm not explaining everything, but there, there we go. And then somehow the point is that, uh, okay, did, did I, um, could I go back again? I mean, does this connection, I mean, I only took this connect component along M, does that actually determine the whole connection? Well, the component along sigma star M will just be the kind of, image under sigma because this connection is invariant because it's pulled back. But what you worry about is the kind of off diagonal terms in this connection here. And they are mapped from M to sigma star M tensor M to sigma. And you can show that they vanish or rather <laughs> the difference between any two vanishes along the R. Um, so they, you know, the, discre the, the discrepancy lives in this cohomology group and because this has um, degree 4G minus four, and this has genus 4G minus three, um, this, is canonic, this is generically zero. Okay, so the claim is that for generic M, a connection on E uniquely determines a connection on M. Um, Okay, so we've got, this is the last slide, I think, of, uh, of um, this construction. So this is the last step. So I have to uh, explain this horrendous looking diagram. So, uh, right, so let's work from the left. So this is the map we had before. So uh, um, we, have, um, uh, we have our curve and quadratic differential and we have a line bundle with a connection on it. And then I've just been explaining this map that says that, you know, you can associate to this um, a bundle, a rank two bundle on the curve C um, with a Higgs field, um, but also with a connection. And what I was trying to explain was that this map is birational. And then this map is something quite easy. I'm just going to take the connection. So I'm going to fix my constant epsilon and I'm going to take this combination. So this gives me, um, um, a map like this. So it's all a bit, 
yeah, I, I realize this is hard to process in real time, but now I've gone and remembered the quadratic differential again, which is the determinant of the Higgs field, and I've remembered the bundle and this connection. Okay, and the point is that this map um, is generically et al. And this goes back to, um, uh, well, this is, so if E is what's called a very stable bundle, you see, what are we trying to do here? Um, I mean, this data, I mean, firstly, I, I could, so I, I, want to, I want to think about the fibers of this map, okay? So what it comes down to is if I fix all this data, how many Higgs bundles are there on E with determinant Q? Okay. So, I mean, you can kind of forget about this because this is just getting reproduced up here. So really it's, yeah, given a bundle and a quadratic differential, how many um, Higgs fields are there on that fixed bundle um, with determinant Q? And so this is where people start talking about the wobbly locus. But um, so if E is um, very stable, then the answer is that there are only finitely many um, possible um, Higgs bundles, possible Higgs fields on E with determinant Q. So this tells you that this map is generically a tile, which is going to be important because that means we can sort of lift tangent vectors for free because this is an isomorphism on tangent space. Okay, so we're nearly there. And now this last step, we just, um, we forget the quadratic differential on top and bottom. So um, the claim is, that, I mean, this square is gonna be a Cartesian square. Okay. And so <laughs> working our way right across this diagram, we were supposed to be making a um, pencil of connections on this bundle here, pencil of nonlinear connections on this bundle here. This stuff doesn't really change very much because this guy is birational and this map is genetically a tile. So it will be enough to construct um, a bundle, uh, construct a pencil of connections on this map. And since this is a um, fiber, since this is Cartesian, we could just pull back if we had a connection here. And of course, we do have a connection here, namely the isomonodromy connection, which tells me that if I deform my curve C, then I can deform a bundle and connect a bundle with connection uniquely so that the monodromy is constant. Okay. So I mean, in a way, this goes via the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. I can I can replace this data by a local system on my curve. And then as I move my curve, the space of local systems remains constant because it's just a topological thing. It's just homs from pi one into my group, PGL2. Um, okay, so we take the isomonodromy connection here, we pull it all the way back and through back through the other diagram. That gives me a, um, a nonlinear connection on this bundle. And then I allow epsilon to vary, I get a whole pencil of these things. And a simple argument shows you that this thing is actually a pencil in the, of the form that we considered uh, before. So that's what I've already explained. Oh, yeah, I should say that these, um, the, the, the crucial thing really is that these connections are flat um, um, and they're symplectic. And so we eventually end up getting this meromorphic joy structure on the space we started with. And it's meromorphic because we have this kind of birational stuff going on here. Okay. So there are loci in here and here where things go wrong. Um, and you can actually compute some examples in the meromorphic setting, and you really see those poles. So, I mean, this thing really is a meromorphic um, joint structure. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. So, um, so the, I mean, there's a pretty, this is a pretty rich um, geometric structure on these spaces. Um, I think, it, I, I mean, I find it uh, pretty fun to play with. And as I say, in the meromorphic settings, you can actually do some computations here. So of course, if C is some high genus curve, it seems hard to imagine computing much. But if you take C to be P1 and your quadratic differential to be something with some poles, 
um, because there aren't any holomorphic differentials in P1. But um, yeah, if you allow your differential to have poles, then um, these things are computable and you get links with things like Panda Bay equations because exactly because you have these isomonodromy connections um, coming up. Okay, so one interesting thing you can do with this space is consider the twister space. So uh, any uh, hypercalar manifold uh, has a, an associated twister space. Um, and it's, um, you know, you can define it straight from the, this pencil of connections we were considering before. So um, remember we had this uh, uh, nonlinear connection, H epsilon. So that was a map from the tangent bundle downstairs to the tangent bundle of X. Um, and the condition that it's flat is basically saying that its image is an integrable distribution in T of X. Okay, so it's closed under the, um, closed under the, uh, the Lee brackets on the tangent one. Okay, so, um, so that means that you can try and form the space of leaves of this um, distribution. And, you know, in general, I mean, in general, you shouldn't just call, you shouldn't just consider the space of leaves. That will be some very non Hausdorff space. Um, I, I'm just learning about this now. I mean, I think, um, uh, I mean, I think there is a analytic version. Um, <laughs> sorry, I should have I should have revised this before. But I mean, basically, it's an algebra. Uh, it's a Deleen Mumford stack, I believe, in the analytic category that you get like this. But anyway, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't understand too well the right, way, right words to say. But um, <clears throat> the point is that you can vary this epsilon here, and what you end up with is um, a, a space fibering over P1. And um, part of the data of this joy structure was a C star action, and that turns into a C star action on Z, lifting the one on P1. So you get this picture like this. Um, and so, of course, this C star action identifies all the fibers away from zero and infinity. So there are kind of three fibers to understand here, the one over zero, the one over infinity, and the one over one. And unlike in the real hypercalus case, there is no um, uh, anti-holomorphic involution going on here or anything like that. So there's no relation between the fibers over zero and infinity. Okay, so you have this... Uh, this twister space, and it would be interesting to try to understand this in these examples. So, well, you always for free get that the fiber Z zero is just the space you started with M, because uh, when epsilon is zero, I mean, you rescale, which is why this is a P1, um, and you basically are taking the quotient by the distribution V, but those are just the vertical tangent vectors. So when you mod out those, you really just get the base back. Remember, x is the tangent bundle of n. These are the vertical tangent vectors. So the quotient is just now. Um, what about the fiber Z1? So this is related to the character variety. So let's just introduce the, the character variety maps from pi 1 into g. I guess this is really the character stack. I'm getting pretty fast and loose by this day. Um, and what you see is that there is an Etal map um, you should really quotient by the mapping class group, which is just, I mean, at some point in our big space, we had the, the guy right at the top was parameterizing a curve with a bundle on it, with a connection and a Higgs field. Um, and you can take the monodromy of, the, of this combination, and um, that will give you a point of this character stack. And the point is that that's preserved. I mean, that passes to the space of leaves precisely because these connections were the isomonodromy connections, right? So the horizontal spaces for this connection H epsilon were precisely the, um, the leaves were the things where this was constant. That's what the isomonodromy connection is. So this tells me that there are, you know, this map from X to here, this is kind of X um, factors via this um, twister fiber. And once, and once you factor that, there is kind of no more kernel to the tangent space. So this thing becomes an Etal map. 
Okay, so more or less, you should think that Z epsilon is, well, almost the character branch. So, I mean, there's an interesting observation here, which is that if, if we pass now to the version with poles, which I should say that we haven't done all the required maths to rigorously construct this joy structure in that case, but that's certainly, um, you know, a, a reasonable thing to try to do. But let's just imagine we've done that. So I told you that in that case, there is this quiver with potential approach to the, 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 um, the relevant triangulated category. And so always Z zero is um, this space N, which quadratic differentials, this is the, the thing that was stability conditions modulo symmetries. But by work of Fock and Gontrov, the analog of the character variety in this setting is what's called the space of framed local systems, that's actually the cluster variety of <clears throat> this quiver Q. It's actually the same quiver that shows up, um, maybe not very surprisingly. So, um, and what's this, what's this all about? Well, I mean, really what I should write here is the cluster modular group, um, but that is induced by an action of, of this auto equivalence group. So it's, it's kind of reasonable to write it like this as well. Um, so what we're seeing here is that, um, that this twister space is giving you a degeneration of the cluster variety to the space of stability conditions, um, uh, which is, well, actually, I, yeah, no, okay, this is, this is slightly bad. So again, really, I should say here, that there is an etal map here, and that's, that's probably rather important. Um, yeah, so apologies for this. Exactly as here, you get, you get an etal map from the twister fiber Z1 to, um, the space of framed local systems, which is the cluster variety. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't think it's exactly the cluster variety. Uh, but nonetheless, you get this degeneration, which um, yeah, I think is kind of an interesting, striking observation. Um, I mean, it's kind of often, it's often been said, and it's kind of clear that the space of stability conditions is a bit like a sort of tropicalization of the cluster variety. Um, and maybe this is related to that, but I don't have a good understanding of this yet. Um, okay, and I must be time up by now. Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, let me just very quickly say what, uh, what I'm trying to work on at the minute relating to these things. So, basically, it's sort of trying to understand how various generating functions, um, for example, Panama Bay Tau functions, um, are related to the geometry of this space Z. So um, just to give an example, you can, you can consider M embedded inside X um, as the um, zero section of the tangent bundle. And then you can consider the projection down onto um, the twister fiber Z1. And now we have nice coordinates on both of these. So on M, you have these uh, period coordinates, these ZIs. Um, and on Z1, uh, well, at least in this meromorphic setting, you have these cluster coordinates. And so you can try to write down the generating function for this map. Um, and this is more or less what physicists call the um, deformed pre-potential for these, uh, well, in the, the, the physical context is they're studying theories of class S. Um, so people ha have studied these generating functions. Um, so, I mean, my motivation for doing this is that it, there's, a, there's another set of examples or another single example where you can take the derived category of the resolved conifold, derived category of coherent sheaves, and you can think about the DT theory of that and construct this correct choice structure. And in some previous work, I thought about this generating function in that context. And I um, discovered that this thing you can think of, I mean, it's an analytic function, but if you expand it in epsilon, um, then yeah, I suppose I should also, yeah, anyway, you can introduce epsilon using the C star action basically. Um, and then you can expand in epsilon and what you get is the genus expansion in bromoff witten theory of this resolved conifold, which you know, is a very simple example of a Calabi-R3 form. So that, that was quite unexpected to me, but of course the physicists very quickly pointed out that they, <laughs> but this was completely expected for them. But um, anyway, it was a it was an interesting result for me at least. 
Um, and so the, the question really is, can you, can you do something similar for these more complicated threefolds Y, G, M? So remember, um, I said one way of constructing this, uh, D, this category D, G, M was as a Fakaya category of some still quite simple threefold, but actually it's sort of measurably more complicated than the resolved conifold. Um, and so the idea would be that uh, trying to, by, by studying the properties of this, uh, this map and the generating function for it, you might be able to get at um, a sort of non-perturbative version of uh, the string partition function in this case. And, you know, certainly I'm not the first to think along these lines. There's work of Teshner and others um, uh, relating the partition functions of these things to isomonodomy tau functions. And in turn, those are kind of closely related to the sorts of geometry we've been considering here. Okay, so I stop there. Thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. Okay. Um... I don't have anything after, so I'm happy to extend question time as needed. Any questions? Um, no, no one has any question. I don't blame them. Okay, so maybe we, we leave it here then. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.